Hey, hey, this is Cedric Youngleman, your host of the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. In this rip with Fred Krueger about how Wall Street doesn't understand Bitcoin, Bitcoiners don't understand Wall Street, and how nothing is priced in. I want to give a quick shout out to our awesome sponsors. These Bitcoin-focused companies are the ones that I use myself and recommend to my friends and family. River is the best place to stack sats and build your Bitcoin wealth. Buy Bitcoin at the tightest spreads in the industry. Have peace of mind thanks to River's 100% full reserve cold storage custody. And enjoy zero fees on recurring orders. Your Bitcoin is your Bitcoin to withdraw at any time. Go to partner.river.com forward slash matrix to get started and earn up to $100 in Bitcoin when you buy Bitcoin on River. Thea is an app for simplified Bitcoin self-custody. With its two of three multi-sig custody solution, you can enjoy maximum security for Bitcoin and the peace of mind that comes with it. Download Thea now at thea.us forward slash Cedric. That's T-H-E-Y-A dot U-S forward slash C-E-D-R-I-C. And get your first six months free and get on the new standard in Bitcoin multi-sig security. If you need help securing your Bitcoin, getting your estate planning and or asset protection strategies in order so that you know your Bitcoin will be there for your loved ones if anything happens to you, put some time on my calendar now at thebitcoinadvisor.com forward slash Cedric. That's T-H-E-B-I-T-C-O-I-N-A-D-V-I-S-E-R dot C-O-M forward slash C-E-D-R-I-C so I can help you solve your problems and get some sleep at night. Bitcoin Day Miami is designed to forge lifelong connections between expert speakers and all good people anywhere on their Bitcoin journey. It has also quickly become my favorite Bitcoin conference. Bitcoin Day Miami brings you high caliber speakers that are only seen from a distance at the big shows and instead brings everyone together in the same room for a strategic day of vision and action. Don't miss this fantastic opportunity to level up your Bitcoin game. Get your tickets today at bitcoinday.io forward slash Miami 24 and use the code matrix for 10% off. And, of course, I know that we'll all go out for dinner and drinks afterwards and get to know each other even better. Grab those tickets now because they're selling out fast. Hope to see you in Miami May 11th. And now, let's enter the Bitcoin matrix with Fred Krueger, the quant from Wall Street for this ultra bullish rip. What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. What do you do? You get out. Fred Krueger is a Stanford math PhD, former Wall Street prop trader and tech startup guru. Fred is a Bitcoin investor and has been a major voice discussing the magnitude, drivers, and flows behind the new Bitcoin ETFs. Fred Krueger, welcome to the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. How are you? Hey, pretty good. Thanks. So uh, happy to be on the Matrix. Yeah, well, I'm happy that you're joining <laughs> us here. You know, and entered the Matrix. Uh, it seems like I, I mean, I started seeing you about four or five months ago. Just kind of blow no. up on Bitcoin. Three Twitter, months ago. Three months ago. Uh, it seems like forever now. I got a pile of tweets mm. here. I call it it's the Kruger dossier of tweets. Uh, okay. Some of them were just striking, so I would just email them to myself and and print them up. Okay. Uh, you know, so but I would love to. Kind of go back to the beginning, you know, maybe not, uh, you know, how much we have to get into Stanford, but I want to go back to Solomon and prop trading yeah. and Wall Street. I mean, I was okay. a young kid, but I remember Black Monday, 1987, Michael Milken, this and, uh, you know, all this yeah. stuff. So uh, what was it like being a, a young prop trader on Wall Street? And, and I, re I remember being on Black Monday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was it that was, like? Uh, it was, it's. You know, it was pretty crazy because I was I was on I was in New York and I remember going I was at the supermarket and the the stock market had just dropped 500 points that day uh in October of 1987 and I remember uh the person behind me says what what happened today and then I said you'll see tomorrow stock market just crashed and then uh, a guy I knew 
with who had a newsletter that everybody kind of in my generation was following his, he said that when he, when he heard the news, he immediately went and, uh, withdrew his four bars of gold from a safety deposit box. And I mean, it really kind of felt like the end was near. I mean, it, it, it almost felt like this, this is the end of the financial system. That, that, that's what it felt like that day. Did I wonder also, I mean, I, I lived in the suburbs of New York city. Yeah. Uh, and I was like 10 years old at that point, but I kind of remember seeing it in the newspapers and a malaise. I think kind of just uh, not everyone in the neighborhood worked in Wall Street, or maybe none did, but just sort of New York seemed like a, a, a financial town. It is. And it, it, well, it is, you know, and uh, so everyone seemed affected. But even back then, to me, what it felt like that the physical imprint of the financial sector was a lot was just in New York. Then it was a lot less around the world yeah. uh, and it was more community based and uh, much more localized. Uh, and now, you know, huge trading centers in Chicago and, and the Middle East and China and just. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you don't have to be in New York anymore, maybe, uh, to be a big time trader. But w what was it like back then on sort of the prop desk at Solomon Brothers? I mean, you know, you read Liars Poker, yeah, you hear about Michael Milken, yeah, uh, all these. Well, Michael things. Milken was Drexel, but yeah, uh, yeah, Michael but I mean, Lewis, wrote, uh, being Michael on the Lewis, street and stuff, yeah. So it was crazy. I mean, it was, uh, you know, it was. You know, in, in Tom Wolfe's book, he calls them the masters of the universe, you know, also written about Solomon Brothers. And that book was also written about my colleague, uh, David Weil, who was uh, who did the, the gold arb trade. And if you ever read that book, um, it talks about the gold arb trade. It actually talks about the, the 42nd floor on uh, 55 Water Street where I worked. We had this uh, the, the energy. On, on wall street was on that on the trading floor was something that had never been observed before and probably will never be observed ever again because uh basically we've now moved into much more of a decentralized everybody working from home you know robots do you know bots do a lot of the work uh, but back then it was you know hundreds of people you know the smartest brightest people in the world crammed into this, you know, giant room with, you know, quotrons and stuff stacked up to the ceiling. And it was incredibly, you know, testosterone heavy kind of uh, environment. You know, it was all, you know, get big or go home. You know, as you know, pe people were insulting everybody left, right and center. Very politically incorrect. You know, we had strippers on the on, in the trading floor. People would like be bringing pizzas to the, you know, it was just, it, it really was the wild west. I could imagine. And how much did, you know, sort of these big personalities maybe move markets and prices, whether it was like heckling, uh, you know, uh, a research analyst. I mean, I've heard stories. I've met Michael Steinhardt. Okay. I've heard stories about him, you know, threatening analysts if, you know, he didn't like the call or get a heads up or something. Right. I mean, I've heard these anecdotally off the record, probably, or, mm -hmm. you know, or quips. But Well, there were there were some, you know, look, I mean, I think we were just at the point I was right at the inflection point where people were starting to bring in quants uh, into Wall Street. So I was one of these, you know, quants, right? I was one of the first quants on Wall Street. So. Basically, my boss, John Merriweather, was, uh, you know, he, he wasn't a quant himself, but he was smart enough to know that th these guys were going to be needed, right? So basically started finding very, very smart people, originally from MIT. That was his original stomping grounds to find these people. And then a couple of people from Stanford and a few other places, right? But th that's kind of what he did is he brought in you know, a bunch of a bunch of smart people just to analyze things and figure out figure out where there were opportunities, and uh, and and that kind of changed the character of Wall Street. And you know, after that, he he went on to create uh, long term capital management (LTCM), which famously blew up, right? Yeah, and I was uh, in college for that. Okay, yeah, so yeah, yeah and that was a big, yeah, it was a big moment in time, and yeah, big moment in time, yeah. So, uh, you know. I had left Wall Street at that point, but you know it was it was uh, it was sort of the end of an era, right? And and I think things sort of changed. 
I've sort of stepped, kept in touch with Wall Street and kind of, I think once you've sort of gone through that education, you always, you sort of see the world a certain way. You're not, you're ne never going completely back, you know? Um, so, you know, I, I have this financial background, but I also, you know, more recently have been involved in tech, you know, recently uh, for 20 years, I've been doing tech startups and, you know, I've had a lot of, a lot of success in, in tech. And, uh, you know, I got involved in um, crypto and then Bitcoin really only, um, you know, and I've had, I've been involved in it for a while now. So, you know, I have, uh, you know, I have this background of, um, I have this background on finance and a background um, in uh, Wall Street, uh, on uh, Bitcoin. And I think those two things together, those two things together, uh, have led me to uh, to see this opportunity in ETFs. Yeah, I, I definitely. You know, and so yeah. that that's kind of how I quote unquote blew up. Is literally, I just started. I just said, "Listen, guys, I I just recorded one video to sort of say, hey, I, I may have something that you, I may know something that you guys have missed here a little bit about this, which is, you know, you Bitcoiners don't quite understand what you guys are what's about to happen to you on the ETF side." And also, my other finance bros, you have no idea what's going to happen once you sort of let this thing in through the the the, the door, right? You're gonna yeah. you're gonna see something, and so I think what we're seeing now is the merger of uh, you know Bitcoin and TradFi, and it's happening under our eyes. We you know we don't know, but you know the first couple months are already pretty impressive. Uh, let's see what the next year looks like or the next two years. But I think it's going to be, it's, it's obviously a lot bigger than anybody thought. Yeah. I mean, let's dig into that then. I, yeah. I think those two uh, sort of the way you frame it up or buttress it around, you know, wall street doesn't understand Bitcoin and Bitcoiners mm -hmm. don't understand wall street. So let's start with ETFs and how, how are ETFs coming for everything? Why are ETFs so important? I think a lot of Bitcoiners think, ah, diversification, not good. Uh, passive and aggressive, not good. But why are these so important in the marketplace? Well, first of all, I think the most important thing you have to understand is ETFs have been growing not quite as much as Bitcoin, but almost. Okay. So if you look at the total amount of ETFs that are out there in, 20, in 2003, there were $300 billion worth of ETFs. And today there's about $10 trillion worth of ETFs, right? So... Yeah. <laughs> So basically, we've grown over 30x in the last 20 years in terms of just volume of ETFs, right? So the ETF the ETFication of the world has really happened. It's happening, right? It's it's this is not a small phenomenon. This is not just something that's you know growing a little bit. No, this is really taking over the world, right? And it's taking over the way people allocate money and invest in money and and manage their portfolios, like. In my days on Wall Street, we didn't have this, you know. The ETFs were invented, but it was tiny, tiny, you know. And uh, even index investing was small, you know. It wasn't the kind of uh, the, the the sort of mantra that it is today, right? So ETFs and index and passive investing has become the norm um, over the last 20 years. And what that means is that once an asset becomes an asset class, right, everybody kind of has to own it. And, you know, Bitcoin certainly is not an asset class until, uh, you know, you could argue it's still not an asset class. You know, the, the CEO of Vanguard sort of is dismissive of it. Like, why would I ever want to own that? JP Morgan. But we're on the way to Bitcoin becoming an asset class, right? And, uh, you know, what's the difference between an asset and an asset class? Well, it, it just means that it's considered a must own by people. You know, it's something that if you don't have exposure, then you're short, right? So in the same way that even equities, I was on a space earlier today with Mike Alfred, and he's like, you know, 50 years ago, equities were not viewed as normal in, in, in a lot of pension funds. They would be like, you should own only bonds, right? So, you know, then it was equities. And then later on, it was emerging market equities, right? And emerging market equities, like, why would anybody want to own equities in, say, Africa or South America, you know, 
or India, right? Well, maybe because India is the most populated country in the world now, you know, and it's one of the fastest growing countries in the world. Maybe you need to have some exposure to India, right? So I think people are sort of rethinking what normal investing is. And I think as they do that, they're going to, in 2024 is the year when they're going to start saying, what role does Bitcoin play in that mix? And do I want to have 0% Bitcoin or do I perhaps want to have one or 2% or more in Bitcoin, right? And who are we talking about here? Because, you know, I just saw a tweet where the total amount of Bitcoin controlled by the ETFs is up to about 4% and change, which about is- About 4%, yeah. Yeah, now that's only maybe double if you look at it like GBTC coming in with 2% already. So, yeah. right, so we've doubled and, and you could say price action has been maybe 1X or 2X during that double. And if, you know, the way they're consuming uh, Bitcoin right now, just hoovering up Bitcoin, uh, who who do you think is buying right now? Who do you think is thinking about this in terms of is it is it retail households or is this high net worth individuals or well, corporations or the the answer the question is is it retail or is it advisory money right right so that's really the distinction right there's there's sort of the retail channel which is you know you can go into your you know Charles Schwab account right now and you can buy um, you can buy IBIT right. You can go into your Wells Fargo account and you can buy FBTC, right? So you can buy something that's pretty much functionally equivalent to Bitcoin with any brokerage account. You can't quite do it at Merrill Lynch yet. And you there's a, a few places, Vanguard obviously doesn't offer it yet. But for the most part, you know, it's not hard to open a Fidelity account, you know. Um, for the most part, there's no barriers now for retail to buy Bitcoin. Yeah. This is effectively now, it's effectively very simple. Uh, you don't have to understand, you know, uh, wallets or self-custody or anything else. You can just go and buy it. And so it's, you know, so I think it's mainly, quote unquote, retail now who's buying it. I do think, uh, I don't think the uh, RIA uh, registered, registered investment advisories advisors are yet really in the picture yet okay i feel like that's three to six months from now that they're really going to get into the picture and actually i think that's the main opportunity <laughs> so i think really we haven't seen much yet right so this is just the tip of the iceberg uh relative to what could happen uh, and yeah. what's likely to happen in 2024 yeah and we'll dig into that i would like yeah. to ask you about vanguard what is their sort of mentality towards Bitcoin, or so even just the way they invest, what is their ethos? Like, you okay, know, so they say Bitcoiners have an ethos. They they have an ethos. Okay, so first of all, if if you want to read one book on, uh, let me see if I have it. I don't have it in the top of my head here. Oh, here it is. One second. This book is a great book to understand Vanguard. Okay, this is called The Bogle Effect by Eric from Bloomberg, who's commenting a lot on the Bitcoin ETF. And what you realize with this book is that Vanguard was started by this guy, Bogle. And uh, Bogle almost had a relig almost a quasi-religious approach to this, uh, to this thing. He invented indexing, right? So he ran... Vanguard was the first index fund in the world. And he basically, uh, his religion was that Americans should own a little piece of American equity. That's what you should do. You're American. What you should own is the S&P 500. And what you should do is invest a little bit of your extra money every year into the S&P 500. And just like in the Bitcoiners, we talk about stacking sats. He's talking about stacking S&P 500 units, right? And so that ex almost identical kind of uh, religious kind of approach to stocks, he, he started pushing as early as I think 1970. Um, but it really only took off in 2000. That's really when it got like sort of, you know, escape velocity. But because his whole, and it was really US stocks, right? It wasn't, 
you know, it wasn't like India fund or anything else. Now, as he got bigger and bigger and bigger and, you know, they said, well, we'll do an emerging markets. We'll do this. We'll do that. Um, but, you know, it really was this idea of um, being an ultra efficient way for Americans to invest in America. So there really is a lot of ethos here. And it's not really about making money, believe it or not, uh, because his entire thing was set up as a almost like a co-op where any kind of profits that he made would go back to the user to in terms of lower fees. So literally he, you know, he died and he was worth a hundred million dollars when he died. Now, nothing, nothing to nothing to complain about, you know. But you know, for a guy who pretty much invented, you know, the largest firm and the financial firm in America, you know, bigger than BlackRock, right? Bigger than BlackRock, and uh, you know, to, to have a hundred million dollars, he chose not to have more than a hundred million dollars. It's like, and he he famously said, "I have enough." And, uh, you know, that, that's kind of his line, you know, and it, there was, uh, he, somebody, somebody said, uh, to him, I think he was invited to Richard Branson or some other billionaire. And, uh, somebody said, you know, that guy, that somebody said, there's this hedge fund manager there who's got $10 billion or something or a billion, couple billion dollars. And he goes, yeah, but he has something that I don't, I have something that he, he will never have. And he goes, what's that? And he goes, enough. I have enough. And so that was the, the, the ethos of Bogle. And that ethos is sort of passed on, even though he's dead, to the, you know, the DNA of the firm, right? The firm is not about making money. The firm is about providing Americans the best possible way to invest long-term their earnings. And they believe, you know, that's sort of written, you know, written in. And I, I think they believe in it just like, you know, Bitcoiners believe that you shouldn't invest in shit coins, you know, and, and, but it's similar type of thing, you know, and, you know, some people are Fred, you, you're, you're promoting Thor chain or something like I'm not promoting Thor chain. I, I just posted something about here's, here's a way potentially you can borrow against your Bitcoin. Right. But, you know, I understand there's this religion Bitcoiners have and, and Vanguard has a lot of that same kind of religion. So, it's interesting you made that comparison. I mean, obviously the Thor thing's been the the talk of Twitter. Uh, I mean, I kind of get the concerns there around sort of, uh, you know, whether uh, just people can get misled and not understand the risk vector there. And, uh, you know, I think just looking at what we think Bitcoin could do, I don't think most people or anyone really needs to take that on. Uh, it just kind of holding pure Bitcoin. Um, so, I, I, I mean, you could definitely comment on that if you want. But I want to ask you too. Um, about like what how would you talk about bitcoin you know as a young trader starting out to you know on, on wall street to john merriweather like how, how would, would you how, how would, would you pitch him this trade and I when do you think, this is when the way think these kind of characters well, would have gotten involved in bitcoin okay or, well i'll tell we you still, one thing yeah i'll tell you one thing apparently uh larry fink who you know runs blackrock and was very anti-bitcoin for years right and it was a young trader who worked at BlackRock who was able to kind of orange pill him, right? I didn't it's, know this at all. Yeah. I mean. Oh, yeah. It's a cu couple of years ago. A, a guy said, listen, I want to investigate, you know, doing a Bitcoin ETF. And, you know, he he got to Larry and he's like, look, Larry, this is I'm, I'm going to explain it to you. And this is it. So how was Larry Fink orange pill? Because this happened recently, right? Mm -hmm. OK, so it happened recently. How I would pitch it is this, is I would say Bitcoin is the future of money in, in a very broad sense. And, you know, uh, Vijay Boyapati had this great graph where it says, you know, for, for the first 2,000 years or 4,000 years of human civilization, money was gold, right? So gold worked pretty well up until about the 20th century, <laughs> Right. And, you know, we had sort of paper gold, but it was pretty much backed by gold. It was dollar bill was 30 ounces of gold and that, you know, that's it, you know. Uh, and that was the case broadly through the middle of the 21st, of the 20th century. And it was officially ended, you know, in Nixon, but it really was over a little bit before Nixon. We didn't have full backing for gold in 1971. Uh, so, you know, 
we've had now this sort of fiat world for let's call it a hundred years. Okay. Since, you know, certainly mm -hmm. since the twenties, right. And the German hyperinflation was, you know, the, one of the first kind of real fiat fiascos, you know, that, that happened, but let's just say a hundred years from the German hyperinflation till today, we have a hundred years worth of fiat and, you know, fiat had some major advantages over gold. And the biggest advantage over gold, it was much more movable than gold, right? Um, I can I can send you fiat. I can send it, put it on the Pony Express. I can, you know, Lynn Alden had this great uh, analogy is, you know, once they invented the telegram, you could telegram people, you know, you could sort of send fiat via telegram, right? And you can't send gold via telegram. You have to send it, put it on the Pony, right? And, and it's a lot harder to get the gold across the country. So... I think gold sort of hit its limit right around the 20th century or the late 19th century. It just kind of hit its limit and it wasn't going to work as the infrastructure for the world. Then we had gold and, you know, then we had, then we, sorry, then we had fiat and now we're headed into the next phase, right? Where actually fiat has obviously certain major problems is that you can print as much of it as you want. It's very uh, dilutable. And, um, and further is it, it doesn't even travel very well outside of countries. Right. So once you start, you know, going from England, from America to India to, you know, or South Africa or somewhere, not so easy to send fiat anymore. It doesn't really work great on the internet. Right. So we need sort of a new kind of money. And so that new money needs to be you need to be able to send that money anywhere pretty easily, but you also want that money to be really hard. And that's Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin has also a couple other great properties that you know you get for free, which is that it's it's auditable. You can sort of see immediately, you know, how much Bitcoin somebody has. They can sign something. They can prove that they have the Bitcoin. Gold, not so much, right? Fiat, not so much. You know, I could have a bunch of fiat in some bank account, but it's not like available open on a public ledger for anybody to look at. Um, and also it's a lot easier to secure your own Bitcoin than it is to secure your own gold. Yeah. You know, so basically Bitcoin is better money and uh, it's 15 years into its existence and it's growing like a power law at, you know, very, very, uh, mathematically precise way and you know i'm a math guy so when you show me the log of bitcoin over the log of time and it's a straight line with an r squared of uh 0 0.94 94 and uh, the standard deviation 95 percent of all observations fall within one standard deviation i'm, I'm like this is a perfect little statistical fit so you've got this great money that's taking off like T to the power six. Bitcoin addresses are taking off as T to the power three. Hash rate is taking off at T to the power 12. Uh, you don't need to be a genius to figure out what's happening here in the next uh, decade or two. It's very clear. Like unless the pattern changes dramatically, you know, we're going up 10 X from here. So then, why don't why why do gold bug bugs have trouble making the leap to Bitcoin? This was a question Luke Royals tweeted in, and yeah, you know, like how did I mean Larry Fink even was talking about how Bitcoin is a flight to safety. It seemed like he said the quiet part out loud a week ago about uh, if you're scared about your government debasing money. Um, why you are would gold think? Bugs well, I'll, I'll tell you why. I think the first problem is if you didn't own any gold or Bitcoin, it's pretty easy to do the analysis and you'll pick Bitcoin. However, if you have already owned gold for a while, it's you're, you're not coming, you're, you're biased already, you know? So the Peter Schiff's of the world who've been promoting and owning gold for 10, 20 years, they have a hard time switching horses. Now you get guys like Larry Lapard uh, and Larry, brilliant guy uh he's you know he's a gold bug from way back when 
but you know, his, he's out there now saying, yeah, uh, I like Bitcoin for exactly the same reasons I like gold, except it's better. And it's probably going to outperform gold. So it's, you know, it takes a certain uh, openness of the mind to accept something as, you know, as a, a better thing than the thing you've been promoting for the last 20 years. And so I, I understand why gold bugs have a hard time with it, but you know, and there's, you know, that they're sort of focused on the physicality of gold and the, you know, alternative use cases like jewelry or electronics, which are quite frankly, irrelevant. Um, yeah. they're, they're irrelevant, but, uh, but it, it, it's hard. It's hard for those guys to understand it as well as it's hard for pure fiat guys to really dig in to understand what's this thing without any earnings? Why should I own any of it? When mm -hmm. somebody can make another one, I can make Litecoin just quickly. What's wrong with Litecoin? Why shouldn't I just buy that cheaper? So, you know, it's uh, both of these things are flawed and they're sort of flawed for different reasons. Yeah. Who do you think is eating who here? Do you think Bitcoin is eating Wall Street or Wall Street's going to eat Bitcoin? Uh, I think a lot of us expected Bitcoin to be financialized and the financialization of Bitcoin. I think there's you know maybe two schools of thought that they get married together and Bitcoin makes the financial world better, stronger, I guess, and you know puts it on steroids somehow, or you know Bitcoin obliterates the old legacy system and or or, or they there's a duality and people are in one or the other. Well, I think the first thing is who. Who ends up owning all the Bitcoin? That's the first question I would say, right? And I would say Wall Streeters are going to end up owning all the Bitcoin, okay? Because I think, um, well, I, not all, but they're going to own a lot of it, right? And the reason I say that is that there's going to be a distribution, right? So the first wave of people who own Bitcoin at, you know, let's say a $1,000, uh, a coin or, or one to $10,000 a coin, you know, once it gets to a hundred thousand or a couple hundred thousand a coin, a lot of them are, a lot of them are, will say, great. Thank you. I'm retiring. I'm living on my Island. I've got my money or they'll sell half their Bitcoin and that's it. Right. So, I, and we're seeing some of that right now, right? Because we're seeing a bunch of the shrimp, the, uh, crabs and the fish, you know, being, uh, one Bitcoin, 10 Bitcoin, 100 Bitcoin or less, right? Um, those categories are, uh, are selling right here. They're, 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 and the whales are, are growing and kind of traditional Wall Street investors are growing. So I do think there's sort of a new class of, of investors who's coming in who are sort of buying and owning some of this. Now, yeah, they only control 4% right now. I think that number is going to change, <laughs> you know, um, I think they're going to end up controlling 20, 30% of, of Bitcoin. And so, but I do think that, you know, they're, they're, uh, so I definitely think they're going to get involved on the, um, the ownership as far as Bitcoin taking over Wall Street. I think it's going to take over a lot of Wall Street as an asset class. Yeah. So I think it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger in people's portfolios. And, uh, I think that's inevitable. I think we're going into a hyper Bitcoinization phase. You know, we're 20, 30 years from now, Bitcoin will be money. It'll be accepted everywhere as money. You'll be able to, you know, every ATM will be a Bitcoin ATM. You know, every, uh, every internet site will accept Bitcoin. Um, Amazon will accept Bitcoin. You know, you'll be able to pay your taxes in Bitcoin. Etc. Right. That that's kind of where I think we're going. Right. Uh, you know, and I don't think we go we get there by government decree. I think it's just becomes more and more and more popular, and eventually they say, "Well, great, let's just uh, you know every again every ATM will become a Bitcoin ATM. That that there won't be a distinction between ATM and Bitcoin ATM." Right. Yeah. I think there's a yeah. I agree with a lot of you saying there. There's a lot to unpack. And in terms of Bitcoin ownership, let's let's talk, we talk about maybe the ETF and sort of the structure there. So, you know, the ETFs are hoovering up all this Bitcoin. Let's say they get to a million Bitcoin. But, you know, people have fractional ownership of these ETFs. Uh, so they, you know, have an ownership stake in the Bitcoin. 
uh, versus like maybe say MicroStrategy, which is one company which has an ownership right. stick of their pool uh, versus you and your own pool. So, you know, let's say on at parity to MicroStrategy, who would have more control of Bitcoin? I don't even know how to how do you think about that question. I wonder how you do. You know, and, and even when when Wall Street owns more, you know, because uh, you you know when you look at it with well, when I say people, Wall Street, it really is you and me, right? So it's, yeah, okay. it's 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 America. America owns more Bitcoin, right? Right. So it's 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 going to be a lot of people having a little bit of Bitcoin in their 401k or right. IRA, wherever they have it, right? That's it. And when you mentioned around 20, 30% of, of supply in these ETFs, I would think that, you know, somewhere around 10, 12, 14%, you're looking at a million dollars a coin. I mean, yes. to squeeze your way up to those levels. Um, yeah. I mean, we're, we're inevitably getting to a million dollars a coin. It's it's not I mean, even a question bare, of if. Yeah, in, yeah. in my opinion, is there's zero question of of if. It's only a question of when. So I mean, this wave that's been coming with the ETFs eating up ten thousand Bitcoin a day. I mean, do you think that's continuous? Do you think that keeps rising? Do you think that's a full steam ahead for another three hundred sixty five days, uh, another ten years? Um, what kind of impact are these ETFs going to have over, you know, in, in the next few years uh, on Bitcoin? So I think it's going to increase. I think I think if you think if you think that we've reached the peak uh, rate, I think you're wrong. I think we're gonna we're gonna go several times higher. We might go to twenty thousand Bitcoin a day, uh, you know, thirty thousand Bitcoin a day. It's possible, right? Uh, why? Because you have to realize that, you know, we're what kind of percent adoption are we relative to mainstream investment? We're nowhere. We're nowhere. I mean, we, you know, the just go to the average person around you and say, how, how much Bitcoin do you own? Most people outside of your kind of bubble of, you know, Bitcoiners, you walk into your average New York, uh, go to your average New York bar and just go sit at the top and say, hey, guys, guys, come around. Hey, we're doing a little poll here. How many uh, of you guys have 5% of your net worth in Bitcoin? None. That'd be like, well, maybe one guy, maybe out of 50, 100, right? That would say, yeah, I got 5% of my net worth. So we're at the absolute beginning <laughs> of this. And by the way, and up until two months ago, those guys couldn't, wouldn't even know where to begin to invest. I get laughed out of Bitcoin. every dad's circle. Um, I've ever in when Bitcoin comes up, whether I'm the one bringing it up or not. Bitcoin just gets mocked, laughed at. Right. So, off, I mean, look, we, we've, got a, we've, we've got a long ways to go before you're, you're not going to be laughed at. You know, get, you know, get ready for more jokes. Listen, I was called. My brother called me today and he's like, hey, Bitcoin's down. You didn't call me, uh -huh. you know. And so, you know, that that's. Look, we're not we're not done with this thing. We've got a long ways to go, at least price wise. I don't think time wise we have that much longer to go. I think in the next year we're going to start. Uh, you know, the revenge will be a, a dish that's served cold. You know, I th I, th I think us Bitcoiners are going to look pretty pretty sharp in a couple of years. Um, but you know. I do think that I, I don't I think we've just started and, uh, you know, I think that we're seeing these signs are extremely positive. And if anything, I expect these things to, to, to continue to grow quite a bit. As well as I do think the interest in self-custody will eventually get much more right? because, you know, once you once you start really paying attention to Bitcoin and you start, you know, you start understanding, wait a second, this thing's going up like crazy. Um, what is it again that I own? Oh, I can uh, hold this thing in uh, my own wallet? Hmm. Oh, and I could take that with me wherever I want and nobody can take it from me? Hmm. Interesting, you know? I mean, looking at it from that perspective, I mean, I, I think that the ETFs just represent the largest honeypot on Earth that a human could actually take. Uh, i.e. a 6102 or any sort of means. I mean, I'm, I'm very curious your thought there of, of, you know, how Bitcoiners should be thinking through maybe, you know, because I think ETFs are a great way to get uh, maybe a, 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 de a defense against the money printer 
and exposure to uh, Bitcoin price, uh, but it doesn't give you those other special qualities of Bitcoin. And I, I do think that there's a non-zero chance they come in some form, even if it's a you can't ever withdraw your Bitcoin, you could only get cash on the way out. Uh, and it's, it's sort of a one way well, street, which is now the way you have. Right. It, right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So. So. I, I uh, so I don't look, I think that at the end of the day, things change when you have 10 percent of Americans who own Bitcoin. Right now, it's, you know, maybe one percent who have, a, you know, even five percent of their net worth in Bitcoin. I think once you get 10, 20 percent of the people who actually have a meaningful amount of Bitcoin. Um, and the government is nothing more in a democracy, right? And you could argue, are we a democracy, a representative democracy or, or something, right? But, you know, what we have is is still pretty special relative to what most of the world has, right? Yeah. And uh, regardless of your politics, you know, you got you got to a love America for kind of its freedom. And I, I do think that, you know, um, as we get a lot more people aligned with Bitcoin, I think it's going to be a, those same people are not going to be super happy at uh, any kind of bill that says we're going to take your Bitcoin. So, you know, I, th I think the, the question, the trick is to get people to get the, them on board Bitcoin quick enough so that they don't. <laughs> so people now sort of say, well, well wait, right. take, take. And I think this is happening. And, you know, you're sort of seeing comments like by Trump as saying, you know, Bitcoin's a, you know, it's an asset that, that has some, some, some virtues, you know, and I don't think even Trump would have said that four years ago. Right. Um, so I think he realizes that, you know, there, there are certain people where that will resonate. Right. And who may not even like Trump, but they are like, Ooh, I like what he's saying there about Bitcoin. Single right? issue builders, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think that's important. And I think, uh, you know, having said that, uh, you know, do I do I think if you're a little bit, you know, the, Andy Grove of Intel said only the paranoid survive. So I think there, <laughs> I think it's good to be a little paranoid, right? It's a bit, it's, it's not bad, right? And I do think, um, you know, if if you understand self custody, I think it's not a bad way to go. You know what I mean? If if you're the average American and you don't want to understand self custody, you don't get it. You, you keys, whatever. You're going to buy the ETF, and that's fine. But if if you really understand self custody, yeah, go self custody. You know, learn learn about all these things. Learn about multi sig. Figure it out. Do the work. You know. Uh, you know. Uh, it, also, there's risk there, too. <laughs> it's the only thing I will say is I've had friends lose their Bitcoin, you know, uh, lose their keys. I've, you know, right. be, you know, I, I've said one thing is beware of SIM swapping. People like, Fred, where's the hardware wallet that has a that can be SIM swapped? I'm like, OK, you have never been. If you say that you've never been SIM swapped. OK, but, you know, I've been SIM swapped twice. I know what it's like to you know, start seeing your, you know, your people go through your Google drive and everything else. Right. And, uh, you know, and you can lose access to your social media accounts. People can start hitting up your friends, asking them for Bitcoin, whatever it is. Right. You know, so you have to be very, very careful. And a lot of that stuff doesn't apply to you. If you have your money in an ETF at uh, Wells Fargo, right. There, it, a lot of this be, are problems that you have if you control Bitcoin in in a in sort of physical format, right? Right. Hard to hard to wrench attack some guy who's got their money in a, a, a you know at Merrill Lynch. You know what I mean? Like right. wrench attack doesn't work so well, right? So it also, I, I guess gives you a plausible. Things, what? It also gives you a plausible out. Like you say, hey, I got all my, you heard I'm in Bitcoin. It's all in the ETF, buddy. It's not here. Which, which I'm sort of saying, look, that's a, that's a valid reason. And another valid reason is you look, I'm, I'm not a young spring chicken anymore. And as you get older, your cognitive be, uh, ability to remember things like passwords goes down. You know, I, I'm still pretty good, you know, but I, will I be great 10 years from now? I don't know. Probably not, you know. 
you know, I, I watched Joe Biden speak and you know, it's it, it's sort of a little bit of a reminder that, you know, where we're all headed at, at some point, right? We're all headed in that direction. And, you know, at, Joe Biden should absolutely not be a self-custody wallet, right? That, that, that does not make sense for him, right? No, he should call me at the Bitcoin advisor and we'll help him secure it for generations to come yeah. uh, in collaborative custody. But, right. uh, you know, kind of, you know, you put up a tweet, uh, a few weeks ago, Cosmo de Medici, when he died, had about 600,000 gold florins. He was the yeah. richest man in the world. And a gold florin weighs uh, three grams. So 600,000 of them weighs uh, 1,800 kilograms or 63,000 ounces, which today actually would only be worth $126 million or about right. 1,800 Bitcoin. Uh, there are about 1,000 people in the world who have that kind of Bitcoin wealth today. And Sailor is one of them. So yeah. what do you think of what Michael Saylor has been doing since he's gone public with his uh, Bitcoin uh, strategy or micro strategy, both personally, maybe, and as a company? And and where do you see, you know, I, I, I'm not, um, you know, you think about Bitcoin as maybe a one-way trade or, you know, when you're going to spend it someday for things that are going to change your life or when it's valued in a way that you think is fair market value. Uh, but I love that trader, you know, sort of mentality and, and talking about trades and, and you know, so... What do you think of maybe MicroStrategy today? Uh, you know, and, and I'll just leave it at that. Uh, you know, throw it out there to you. Well, look, I, I, I think, you know, I used to own MicroStrategy, the stock, right? I owned it from, you know, January of uh, 2023, uh, and I, you know, paid a hundred and sixty dollars a share for MicroStrategy. Uh, I sold it in the six hundreds. Uh, right around the beginning of the year. And I sort of said publicly, look, I've owned this stock, but, you know, uh, it's it's trading at a premium to Bitcoin. I, 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 I'd just rather have Bitcoin. And what I did is I actually bought call options on the BITO futures uh, at that time. But then I got back into it. And, and why did I get back into it? I bought call options on MicroStrategy. Uh, and part of the reason I got back into it is I sensed that MicroStrategy was becoming a little bit like um, uh, CMGI, right? Back in the, it's a stock they used to trade back in the internet days. It was sort of, it held a lot of assets, right? And um, CMGI always traded at 2x the value of the sum of its parts of its assets. And so it, it traded at, there was a, pre, a big premium, right, to the asset value. So I was sort of thinking maybe, you know, it, it really feels like to me that, that Sailor is building this kind of internet, the Bitcoin holding company that might be valued at actually quite a premium to its, uh, to its assets. Now, what we saw last Friday was a company tried to say, no, 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 it's only worth what it, its assets. Uh, I'm going to short the stock and buy Bitcoin against it. And they got stopped out of the trade. And this is what caused this like crash in the market. So look, I think it's, you know, whether, whether it should be worth that or, or not, I don't know. But all I know is that it's sort of turned into a meme stock at some point. And, you know, it's a holding company. It's a meme stock. There's, it's sort of being valued a little bit more than as a sum of the parts. And I certainly wouldn't want to bet against it right now, you know, and I, I sort of put out this video today. I sort of said, you know, remember GameStop, you know, and the movie Dumb Money. And, uh, you know, it just... It's not a great idea to bet against these things in a real bull market or when you know, you've got a whole bunch of people going the other way because you might be a, you might be completely right in the long run, but in the short run, you're dead. So it doesn't matter, you know? So listen, I'm, I, I, I think what he's done is, is, is remarkable. He, he picked, you know, he took a company that was an also ran, you know, sort of tech stock and he turned it into, you know, yeah, you know, one of the most exciting plays on Bitcoin today. Now, you know, listen, I don't think it's going to make as much of a difference as BlackRock and 
fidelity in the greater scheme of things for Bitcoin price. I think it's interesting, but you know, I, he's a great champion of Bitcoin. At this point, he's less important than the overall Wall Street adoption of Bitcoin ETFs. But I wouldn't bet against him. I would not bet against Mr. Saylor. He's, uh, you know, he's obviously smarter than me. And he, you know, he bet the ranch. You know, he, he's got, you know, he's got, he's got you know, some, some real serious guts over there, you know. So I think it's, you know, it's conviction. It's all about conviction, right? You know, conviction and timing. And I think he, he's got both. His timing was great getting in in uh, 2020 was, was a great time to get in. And I, I think his conviction is, is amazing. And at the end of the day, that's all, that's all you need, right? You have to have conviction and timing. And that's, that's, that's 90% of everything. How much of, do you think his play is just trying to, uh, you know, win King of the Hill, you know, and, and show the other billionaires that he's smarter, that he can, uh, deploy capital better that he can make the greatest trade of all time do you think people like jeff bezos mark zuckerberg tim cook sergey brin have even taken note to the to the degree where they're like huh should i do that with my company or huh he's coming for my throne as richest man in the world do you think like he's laid groundwork in a positive way to get these guys to kind of think about this or is he kind of pissing in the wind publicly? But I mean, he's not, not you know, still doing great things, but like, it, you know, uh, to, to what end is this and, and what kind of impact do you think he's had on, on these other uh, kind of huge capital? Uh, look, I think his biggest impact might be on sovereigns, right? So I think it's not going to be on Bezos or Musk, right? Because all of these guys have egos. And the last thing they want to do is try to compete it with a guy who already has a 200,000 Bitcoin head start, right? But if I'm, uh, you know, United Arab Emirates or I'm, uh, you know, um, Singapore uh, uh, Wealth Fund, uh, you know, if I'm, if I'm one of these things, I probably want to get exposure to this asset sooner rather than later. You know, I, there's no, why do I, do I want to wait until it gets to 500,000 before getting a big amount? Or do I want to get some now relatively soon, 2024. And I think having Michael Saylor sort of say, I'm a, I'm a sort of smaller, relatively smaller, U.S. tech company, and that I now own one percent of the entire Bitcoin supply. Well, if I'm UAE, I'm saying, well, give me three percent. You know, I'll take three. Right? <laughs> Why not? You know, uh, uh, if I'm Saudi Arabia, you know, I'll take a couple percent. What do you? What am I? Chop liver? You know. So I kind of feel like that's really uh, the people who I think could be most. Now, obviously, there's a lot of political reasons why they may not want to do it or announce it, right? Maybe they want to do it in private. They want to figure out a way to own this without them coming out and say, by the way, we've, <laughs> we're buying, we're not buying any more dollars in our treasury. We're buying Bitcoin or we're buying Bitcoin as well as dollars or whatever, right? It's not necessarily, you may not want to do that and upset the American military uh, or the American, the political establishment. But I definitely think that those conversations are those conversations are certainly being had right now, right? And I think that's the bigger shoe to drop. It's not another Michael say. I don't think Tim Cook's about to to buy Bitcoin. I, I that would surprise me. Well, Apple could roll out a wallet. Apple couldn't. Apple could put a little, you know, a half a percent on their balance sheet. But what what I really want to ask is, you know, you know, you mentioned sort of maybe Weimar Republic. Uh, and now you mentioned sovereigns, and I would I would think that, um, you know, these th there's got to be some sort of unforeseen event that's going to be bigger than ETFs. I would think sovereign stacking would be bigger than ETFs in a way. Maybe they, you know, they they contribute to you know uh, the marketing of ETFs. I think it's people. well, I think it's later, right? So I, I think maybe. Do you think something's coming though, like that? 
I mean, the ETFs, you could kind of, you know, you knew they were filing paperwork. There were legal cases. There was, you know, we could see the ground being laid and you could, right. you know, guesstimate whether you think it's going to have a big impact or not. But I would think there's things coming down the pike that we don't even see coming. They're going to be like pouring kerosene on a fire. Um, like a major financial crisis. And that's another thing I wanted to ask you, you know, do you think we have, you know, a Black Monday in the offing, an LTCM, a great financial crisis, a 50% drop in equities, and maybe a great decoupling at that point with hard assets and specifically? Well, look, here's here's the thing. I don't, I think that if you look at Bitcoin over the last, you know, it's been around 15 years, right? It's been around and it's done well in uh, low interest rate environments uh, where interest rates have been zero. Uh, it's done okay in high interest rate environment. We're in a high interest rate environment today, right? I would consider interest rates high right now, right? It's doing very well in a high interest rate environment. Um, so, you know, are interest rates correlated with Bitcoin? I would say no, right? I would say at the end of the day, this is not so much a macro thing. I know everybody thinks of it as a macro thing, but I just actually don't think it's a macro thing. I think it is very much, it may look on a day-to-day -day basis or week-to-week -week or maybe even month-to-month, -month, but I just actually don't think it's macro, right? I think Bitcoin is its own animal. Um, and going back to this power law, I think it's, you know, it's it's growing around this, you know, trend line, this power trend line, and the logarithm of Bitcoin is growing with time. And it, it doesn't really matter what the macro is. So, um, you know, I think things like the ETFs help. Things like if the Fed lowered interest rates, that probably would help. Uh, but you know, I don't think it, I don't think it's really necessary or that. I, I don't worry about macro that much. What about the having? Is the having priced in, Fred? Look, uh, I don't think the having, does it matter. Does not matter. I think so we're what done do you with think that. of uh, Michael Saylor? And I, I thought this was very interesting. We're entering maybe the next 10 years of the Bitcoin rush, of the gold rush of, was it 1854 to 1864? You know, where, uh, you know, where, and, and the way he kind of explains, we go from. Uh, so are we at the uh, Bitcoin gold rush? Where Look, the we're, next we're, 10 years are crucial, yeah. where we go to, you know, because at the end of the next 10 years is when only 1% is left. Yeah, so I don't think exactly. I listen. I don't think that. Uh, I think r effectively right now it's all gone. Okay, so we have six percent left. That's it. Okay, we're at ninety three point six percent. Okay, right now, so we have six percent left. Period. And yeah, you're right. The five percent will be gone. But look, it, it's sort of like stock to flow. The stock is fixed at this point. Twenty million. That's that's the stock, right? More or less you know, with, within a couple of percent. So the flow is going down. It's going down exponentially. It's, it's dropping by a factor of two every four years from here. Right. But the stock's not moving. Right. So um, I, I just don't think that the supply decrease in the next four years is going to matter that much. I think what's going to matter the most right now is how much this thing gets adopted as uh, an institutional asset, uh, and 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 broadly speaking, as an investment asset on Wall Street and with other funds. But I I just the having to me is it doesn't matter. Cycles don't matter. I wouldn't look for a big drop in four years. I don't think it matters. Now, could we see an eight year massive bull run and maybe a a six year uh, correction? Sure, why not? This is a financial asset, right? Financial assets do have bear markets. <laughs> you know, I, I I mean, the tech bubble peaked in 2000 and didn't get back to that same level, uh, NASDAQ 5000, until, um, you know, until 2010, right? So, <laughs> uh, you know, you can go for a very long, bear, the bear, bear markets can last for a long time. You know, uh, bubbles can pop. And, you know, I think we're in the process of inflating this big Bitcoin bubble, you know, but I think we'll overinflate. I think we're going to get to a bubble type phenomenon, right? And listen, I was in the tail end of the Japanese stock market bubble. And I remember what it was like in Tokyo in 1990. And, you know, they were just 
cruising through the last in the last year of their uh, 40 year stock bubble that took the Nikkei up from uh, the Nikkei was at a hundred and in uh, 1990, it was almost at 40,000. So it almost had gone up 400 times in the space of 40 years. Um, and, uh, you know, then it popped and then, then it would drop, you know, about, about a couple of weeks ago, we hit that, that same level. But it took us 20, it took us uh, almost 30 years to get back to that same point. And I remember the day in Tokyo where it popped. So, you know, it, we could be in a long bear market, but not right now, right? Like, I think right now we're in the beginning of a bull market and we're going to have this extraordinary, long, very powerful bull market that's going to create all kinds of, you know, wealth. And it's going to overdo itself. It's going to get taken out of hand. Everybody's going to go, we're going to go from Bitcoin skeptics to people who are just, you know, over believers in Bitcoin. And, you know, at that point, it's going to go too much and it'll pop and everybody will go, well, that was, it'll be like the dot com bomb. And everybody will be like, well, that was stupid. The internet will never work. So that's kind of what I expect just as a student of financial history. Uh, I, I would expect us to go too much in this direction. And, uh, but I think it could be, it could be, what I don't expect to happen is a, another four year cycle exactly on, on, on the happening. I, I think that's a mythology and, you know, that's all created with three data points. And I just don't see that happening anymore. And so I don't, I don't think it's just statistically valid or relevant. doesn't matter. So, but I'm very, very bullish, you know, for the next couple of years. Um, but, you know, the next couple of days, I have no idea what Bitcoin's going to do. Yeah, it, it, it's incredibly difficult to forecast. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you did tweet uh, a few weeks ago, once we clear all time high conclusively, like 75K, I am convinced we go to 150K very quickly. And we've seen Bitcoin do, you know, tremendous uh, sort of doublings within, you know, very quick time frames after yeah. regaining all time high. You also tweeted out Bitcoin's ultimate potential is about 10 million per coin or 20 percent of world assets. The yeah. only way it gets to more than that is if we get massive inflation or somehow massive growth, but both seem unlikely to you. So at 100K per coin, which will be very at very, which we will be at very soon, we are at 1% of the final value. There's really only one question. When do we get to 10 million? Uh, so PS Sailor is wrong. It doesn't go up forever, Laura. The game ends at 10 million. So, yeah. Um, and do you think uh, volatility increases or decreases from here? And do we have major drawdowns on this way to 10 million? But why do we top out at 10 million? Why not 50% of world assets? Why not well, uh, everything mean, divided by 21 million? Well, okay. uh, you, you know, you, everything, there's, there's other things in the world besides Bitcoin, right? There's houses, there's equities, there's bonds, you know, there's other things, right? So so Bit, Bitcoin can't be everything, right? It, it can be it can be its share of everything, you know? And I think, but I think a good reasonable approximation is gold, right? If you look at, in 1970, gold was sort of the same value as the S&P 500, right? Mm. So, you know, stocks and gold were about the same, right? And now stocks is about 10 times gold, right? So really the question is, you know, are we going to get back to a world where stocks and the new gold, Bitcoin, are going to be about the same? Yeah, I kind of think so. You know, uh, I just don't think you, you know, r realistically there's activity there's, you know, there's, you know, and by the way, the activity is going to be great. There's going to be great new companies that are going to be formed, you know, and great new activity uh, places to invest and everything else. And so in that new world, it doesn't mean it's the end. It just means that Bitcoin is now kind of growing at GDP, which is great, which is exponential growth, by the way which is actually faster than power law over the long term, right? So people are like, well, power law, that's T to the power six. Well, how about compound growth? That's two to the power N, two to the power T, right? That's exponential. Exponential always beats power over long periods of time, right? And I think if we have purely sound money and it is growing at this exponentially at the, at the compound growth of the economy, well, that's a great that's a great investment, right? You're loving life. You just own Bitcoin and you're loving life, right? So, it, you know, it's a very 
it's a very, you know, if this happens, it's a great, great um, scenario for, for everybody. So, you know, it's, uh, it's not negative, right? I'm just saying that I just want to be a little bit realistic when people sort of, they're multiplying their, you know, 0.1 Bitcoin by 10 million and they're going to be like, wow, I'm going to be a millionaire. Well, maybe, you know, maybe you can, maybe you'll be able to afford a house with your 0.1 Bitcoin, you know, but let's, you know, let's not get caught up too much. I think that might be a little bit ambitious. Uh, my goal is to see a million dollar Bitcoin and I, I'm, I'm, you know, let's, let's first get to a million then we can sort of see if we get be much beyond that, how, how much more we get beyond that. My goal is to see, get to a million within a decade, right? Now, could we see the, a million within a couple of years? Yeah, maybe we get, maybe we're lucky. Maybe, you know, two, three, four years, we get to a million. That's possible, right? Um, I would love to see that, right? Do I think we're going to get to 10 million within five years? Like plan B suggest or suggests on their website? No, I do not think that that's in the cards. I think that's, you know, again, if that happens, you're welcome to come visit me on my island. You know, when I buy Virgin Gorda from Richard Branson, you can come visit me and we can go water skiing. Um, yeah. So anyways, that's kind of what I think. I think that uh, it, it's a very, look, th there's nothing to not like about this scenario. I hope the scenario comes true. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, let, let's not get too excited either about like all the money we're all going to make either, you know. I think if it gets to a million, that that's an amazing, amazing outcome. And, and I think, uh, a lot of people would be, that's, that's a great exit point, you know, like you might want to diversify and, you know, buy some real estate or buy whatever you want to buy, you know, at that point, or maybe even a little bit before that point, you know, but you know, that's kind of my, and it all depends on your individual and your age and everything else. So, yeah, of course, not financial advice, but not you know, financial to advice. You know, you tweeted on February 29th that Satoshi could have never imagined this. I mean, what do you think Satoshi would make of ETFs and maybe sovereign adoption and the, the price points we're talking about? Well, listen, I think Satoshi left the project in March of um, 2011, right? And, you know, it was very much still a startup when he left. Now, um, I think, you know, it was the entire market cap of all the Bitcoin that had been mined up till then was about $5 million, you know? So if by any standard, it would have been an early stage startup, <laughs> you know? Uh, and, you know, he, it's not like he even owned five million. He, he owned like 10%, you know what I mean? Like on paper, right? So half a million dollars and he left the project. And so look, I think uh, I, it's, it's, it's really, I think, Satoshi built this thing in an ingenious way. And he built this, this thing that has grown like a virus. Um, but how it's grown, I don't think anybody could have predicted, you know, you know, I think the idea of an ETF was hard to predict, you know, I mean, certainly the Winklevi brothers said, you know, had sort of talked about it pretty early, but you know, it was, it's not, it's, it's taken 10 years for this thing to actually not, maybe not 10, but eight years for this thing to actually happen. Um, and, you know, I think the idea that Larry Fink would be, you know, the, the main evangelist for the Bitcoin ETF is kind of crazy to me. Like you know, <laughs> the guy who was four years ago saying how it was sort of nonsense now is the main evangelist for it. Um, you know, I guess Jamie Dimon's probably going to be telling everybody how great it is in a year or two from now. You know, that that's probably the next thing we're going to see. But um, so I don't think, look, the future is hard to predict. But I can tell you that what's not hard to predict is that this um, Bitcoin adoption does seem to be growing very, very uh, relentlessly. And so I, I think there's not there's nothing that anybody can do is going to stop it, uh, slow it down. I think it's pretty much just going to happen at this point. So that's what kind of, you know, and I was on today with Mike Alfred and we're like, yeah, it doesn't actually matter what we think or what the RIAs think or what they don't think, you know, it's going to happen. And so, 
you know, it, and it really doesn't even matter what, you know, if they approve an Ethereum ETF or not or whatever. Yeah, Bitcoin's going to win. It's sort of been written in the cards. And, uh, you know, all you have to do as a Bitcoiner is not sell your Bitcoin. <laughs> That's kind of the only thing you have to do. And it's harder than it may sound, right? Because you have these dips, you panic. Emotions are, you know, it's, it's easy to get very emotional about this thing. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I, I, but, you know, I think if you're young, you can still have many years to keep on stacking. You know, if you've got some Bitcoin, try not to sell it, you know, <laughs> try to hold on for a few more years, you know, don't panic. Um, that, that's kind of what I, what I would sort of say to people. And obviously, try to get as much personal conviction as you can, you know. And how you do that, I think, depends on you. Um, you know, for me, I think it was, you know, I, I met this guy, Tom Lee from Fundstrat in 2019. And, you know, that guy really convinced me something about what he said with demographic arguments on Bitcoin. That totally convinced me that I, you know, needed to take a position. Um, but you know, what, what it may be for you, it may be one thing, it may be money printing, it may be something else. Uh, you know, everybody's different. So does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Um, you know, it, it's interesting, uh, just kind of really focusing on, on price and why, you know, maybe a lot of people are here. So, and when people are maybe being honest, so, uh, on January 8th, you tweeted out, I am only interested in number go up. The only reason any investor buys an asset is to make a long-term return. I understand Bitcoin has all kinds of uses that don't apply to me, evading authoritarian countries, not paying taxes, keeping assets out of the clutches of ex-wives. All great reasons for Bitcoin number to go up. But I call right. BS on anybody who's in it for social change in Africa, slash South America, slash Middle East, etc. This is a new form of woke Bitcoin. I'm a capitalist and a rational player. If number goes up, I can buy all kinds of great things with my Bitcoin. If number goes down, nobody will care about Bitcoin. It will have been a bad trade, a trade that I've held for years. I don't yeah. buy the argument one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin any more than the nonsensical economist on my feed earlier claiming one euro equals one euro. Let's focus on the bucks. The rest is conversation. Yeah. So look, I mean, look, I think as a, you know, I think there's a lot of reasons to own Bitcoin, right? If you're if you're in Nigeria and you're trying to get your money out of Nigeria or you're trying to get your money to your daughter who's going to be moving to the US, uh, that's a different reason than an American boomer investing in their, you know, 401k, <laughs> you know, in, in Wells Fargo, right? Everybody has a different reason to invest, right? But why are people interested in putting money to, in Bitcoin? Because number goes up, right? And that at the end of the day, it's, it's number goes up or doesn't go down in the case of the Nigerian, right? That's like, it's going to hold its value, right? It's, it's designed to hold its value, but it's, you know, it's a savings technology. And the reason you save is for number goes up. Now, there is this sort of school that, you know, the world's going to be a better place after Bitcoin. That eh, maybe, it may be, you know, after hyper Bitcoinization, I don't know, I'm going to be very old once we get to hyper Bitcoinization. And yes, it, I think it's inevitable. Um, in a world where Bitcoin's the new norm, it's probably a better world than the fiat world right now. Um, it's probably more efficient, you know. Uh, there's a lot of problems with this fiat world. And I think that's why we're going to the Bitcoin world. But at the end of the day, I think for any individually per, individual per, person, if you don't own Bitcoin and you you choose to sit out the owning Bitcoin part of this thing, and you just uh, and you just come in and uh, sorry, and uh, and you you come back in um, uh, twenty years when Bitcoin's uh, hyper Bitcoins, yeah, your life may not be that much better, right? <laughs> like. You still may not be able to afford a house. You still may not have a great situation, right? 
So really, I, I just would say, you know, it's sort of like there's a part of this, which is you need to buy Bitcoin in order to kind of participate in this. And, uh, you know, it's not just going to make the world better for everybody. It's going to solve all this e equality. No, there's going to be a lot of inequality, right? People, people who did do the buying of the Bitcoin are going to be in a much better position than the people who didn't do the buying of the Bitcoin. The people who did do the buying of the Bitcoin are going to boss around the people who didn't do the bu buying of the Bitcoin, who are going to be, you know, the worker bees, and they're going to do stuff. So, you know, the world is not a fair place. You know, we're not sort of headed into this kind of socialistic, you know, egalitarian utopia. And Bitcoin doesn't solve, solve that problem, right? We're not all equal. I don't believe that. And so... You know, I think that um, at the end of the day, I think, you know, uh, I think it really is about um, is this a, is this a, a decent place to park your money long term or not? And that's the only thing I'm just sort of calling out a little bit of BS on some people who are like, I'm just doing it to, quote unquote, change the world. Well, you are and you aren't. You are because you believe in Bitcoin and you want to spread the word. But you also deep down have this belief that your Bitcoin is going to be worth a whole lot more at some point when you decide to not sell it, but spend it, right? And so there's this notion of differentiating spending your Bitcoin and selling your Bitcoin. You're not selling your Bitcoin for something else. You're spending your Bitcoin for a lifestyle, right? And you own Bitcoin because at some point later on in life, you will spend your Bitcoin or you will pass your Bitcoin on to your children, right? Your wife, your children, your husband, right? So, and, you know, Bitcoin 1 million, my Bitcoin goes a whole lot more further. It buys a lot more than at Bitcoin, you know, 68,000 or wherever we happen to be right now, right? So, um, so yeah, I, I do care about the price of Bitcoin. Not that I'm going to sell it, not that I'm going to trade it, but, it's just a metric of, you know, what can I expect my future to look like with this Bitcoin that I hold? So I think price is important, you know? Yeah, no yeah. doubt. I think price is important. I think that, you know, most people come for the gains and the money. Um, I do think that there's, you know, aspects that are aligned here, you know, and, and levels of, you know, sort of philosophical ways of looking at money. But I think that, you know, it moves us towards a merit-based economy, and I, I think that Bitcoin is is a form of a boycott, even if you don't make money on the boycott or lose money and you know donate right. it. Uh, but you know, I, I think most people are here to see it go up and give them more power and more say and more push and the levers in that direction. It's a, I mean, look, um, it is a revolution. It, there's no doubt that it's kind of a revolution. But you know, it's not like we're really doing that much. Yeah, no one's. Uh, you know, yeah, work. we're not taking up arms in the physical sense and laying down our lives uh, necessarily in mass and uh, risking it in that sense. But you brought up sort of fair fairness there, and does Bitcoin have a fair price? You know, the way we think of like mark to market and fair market value and things of that nature. There's no fair price for Bitcoin. I don't think I don't think there's really a fair price. I mean, what's what's fair? Is twenty thousand dollars a coin fair? Is two hundred thousand dollars a coin fair? No, there's no there's no notion of what's fair. There's the notion of what somebody's to pay for it and what somebody's going to sell it for. That's it. Which I look. I think at the end of the day, it's 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 just an adoption thing. It's inevitable. And, uh, and I go back to this power law thing. I think that's, that's as close as we get to fairness is, you know, how far are we off from the normal curve here, the normal adoption rate of this, this asset. And so, you know, I expect a fair amount of volatility going forward, but you know, not that much really. I mean, it's, it's within one share deviation of Bitcoin, by the way, is down by 50% up by a hundred percent. That's the sort of that's the deviation. Um, and then the peak to trough of that is 100 going down to 50, which is 75% drop, right? So, you know, the, 
the excess of that is just a little bit more than the top standard deviation. So you're at 125 percent of you know normal, and you're dropping to about yeah a little below 50 percent of normal. That's like an 80 percent drop. But you know you're sort of everything's happening in log space. So so you know in log space it's about a 0. 0.3 standard deviation, which is you know 10 to the power of 0. 0.3 is two. 10 to the power of minus 0. 0.3 is um, uh, zero point five. So that it gives you a sense of what's normal for this, but I, I definitely feel like it's on a, a general. Uh, uh, it's on a general path of um, forty five percent per year, roughly. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, I mean, you also tweeted out. On March 3rd, you know, you shouldn't use a dollar as a yardstick. You should use New York condos. Right mm -hmm. now, the average two bedroom New York condo is about one and a half million dollars. So a hundred Bitcoin equals four condos. I think in 10 years, 100 Bitcoin we equal 40 condos. At the peak, 100 Bitcoin equals 400 condos. Yeah. So what do you think happens to real estate vis a vis Bitcoin? And the, you know, I mean, if Bitcoin is worth that many condos, what does that do in the condos in New York City? Well, I just think, I think, look, Bitcoin's going to appreciate. If I had to guess, right, I think that the, I think most of the gains on Bitcoin are going to happen over the next 20 years, right, overall. And uh, I think we get to, you know, my so sort of scenario is we get to a million dollars a coin within 10 years. I think we get to $10 million a coin within 20 years, right? So actually, most of the gains are going to happen on a dollar basis from 10 to 20 years, right? So, you know, we're going up like, again, from 100,000 to a million to 10 million, roughly, right? You know, that's sort of my mental model of this. And um, I would guess that in this kind of situation, you know, uh, real estate will probably go up maybe by a factor of two over this kind of period, the first period, maybe a period of four over the second period. But, you know, Bitcoin's going to probably outperform real estate by quite a wide range. Um, so I tell a lot of young people who are just sitting there going, itching to buy their first house. I'm like, eh, if I were you, I might just wait a little bit. You know, I would, I would say a, a smarter idea would be to rent and put some money in Bitcoin for, you know, four or five years. Um, and uh, does that make sense? Yeah, I get that. I, I'm I'm going to ask one or two more questions here to wrap it up. So okay. what do you think? How do you think you're if you were 25 years old getting on the street today, how your brain would react to looking at Bitcoin charts? Would it be different? What would you want to do? Would you want to like just I mean, would it be a little different? Do you think you'd be as primed to get it? Do you, Are you thankful that? you found Bitcoin where you are now, or do you wish you found it earlier in life? I mean, a lot of people kind of ask that question, you know, cause it's a lot, it's a lot of like, Oh, if I found it now, I can maybe allocate or reallocate to it later in life. But earlier in life, you, you, you might not get it or you might get it, but you might not have to any money to allocate to it or so. Yeah. I mean, do you think, how would you look at Bitcoin? If you were coming on the street today, would you be super psyched about it? Do you think you'd get it? No, I don't think, look, I mean, at the end of the day, I, I really only have really gotten complete Bitcoin religion for, you know, four years right now. I don't think it makes much difference four years or zero years. Like it doesn't matter. Right. I think the mistake that a lot of young people are going to have is being jumping in and being too aggressive. Right. That that's your, probably your biggest mistake. Don't, don't do leverage. Don't, you know, don't go completely crazy. Don't buy, don't think that Bitcoin is too has is already passed and you need to buy Shiba Inu, right? That's your danger point, I think. Um, you know, it's just it's 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 probably a great investment, but you're going to have to be a little patient. You're going to have to wait. Same as I've waited. You know, you're gonna you may have to go through big bear cycles. But look, it's just there's no shortcuts. You're going to have to wait a little bit and. Uh, I just see a lot of people just, they're just, they're, they're, 
too much in a hurry. Right. And so that's the biggest problem I think is, is, you know, you, you gotta be somewhat patient. Um, and, you know, um, I hope that helps, but yeah. anyways, that's my view. So my final question is, uh, are you writing a book, Bitcoin for capitalists? I, I, I started it. I've written about, I don't know, maybe 25 to 30% of it. I need to find more time to finish it and, you know, hopefully I'll get it done. But, uh, you know, I, I've been thinking about this a lot. You know, I put a lot of these tweets out there and there's a lot of, I've got a lot of texts and thoughts and ideas and stuff. Now I'd love to get it all into a book this size, you know, like this book's an excellent book, by the way, this, uh, I got to read that. I'd love to have him on the show. Yeah. So you should absolutely get him on the show. He's, he's great. Um, yeah. So listen, I'm hopefully this year we'll have the book out inside. I actually hope I, I get this book out before, uh, the price is two hundred thousand dollars per. Ah, that's gonna yeah. be tough. Yeah, that's 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 the that's the tough thing. Uh, but, to ra- to to round it out, I'm gonna read one more tweet from you. How yeah. to stack Bitcoin? Unlike Keith Quad Four McCullough. Step one: plow any extra savings into Bitcoin. Step two: don't worry if it's fifty-two k or twenty-six k. Just buy. Step three: forget your hedge eye trading course. It's garbage. Quad Four is quad bullshit. Step four. Get a decent stack in a few years. Footnote, I googled Quad 4 and I found this Keith Herring print, which I ironically own. It's great, unlike the other Quad 4. <laughs> so are you going to sell the Keith Herring print for Bitcoin? No, no look, I, I got a lot of stuff that's kind of stupid and not going up in price, but has sentimental value. And that I actually love that Keith Herring print, so... I would, I, I don't it's a big print i can't just bring it over and show it to you but it's uh it's it's enormous but it's yeah it's i love it and uh and so anyways uh well thanks for having me Senator. yeah man this has been enjoyable fred uh okay. let people know where they can find you and your work yeah so just hit me up on uh twitter i'm on dot kruger on twitter and then there's a link there to my youtube on my twitter and i launched a youtube uh channel 11 days ago which is I already got 5,000 subscribers, so nice. pretty psyched. Awesome. Um, but, but thanks a lot, Cedric. I really Thank appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Be Mike. Well. And that's what's up this week with Fred Krueger on the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. I hope that you found it as fun and enlightening as I did. Hit us up. We'd love to hear your feedback. And thank you for tuning in. If you want to buy sats and build your Bitcoin wealth, head over to River using my link to get up to $100 in free Bitcoin at partner.river.com forward slash matrix get your sats off your exchange and secure them with the new standard in bitcoin multi-sig security and get six months free when you download the thea app at thea.us forward slash cedric that's t-h-e-y-a dot u-s forward slash c-e-d-r-i-c if you need some help securing your bitcoin getting your estate planning and or asset protection strategies in order so that you know your family and loved ones will get your Bitcoin if anything happens to you. Put some time on my calendar at thebitcoinadvisor.com forward slash Cedric. That's T-H-E-B-I-T-C-O-I-N-A-D-V-I-S-E-R dot C-O-M forward slash C-E-D-R-I-C. Put that time on my calendar now before Bitcoin goes parabolic again and you can't get any more sleep at night. Finally, please give the Bitcoin Matrix podcast a five-star review wherever you dome your pods. That would really help me get the word out and help new listeners to find the show. Keep building, keep stacking, and always be laser-focused out there. This is Cedric. Peace. Peace.